section where we talk about uh, members that are in particularly difficult situations. We keep what we call a, a, an internal care list, and we discuss those situations and share knowledge. And, and then we always ask, is there anyone else that we should add to this list? And then we also will just go through one letter successively through the membership directory each elders meeting, just talking through how each of the individuals are doing from what we know. So we're not quite as structured and as accomplished as Richard Baxter was in this, but these are some, there are other there's more to it, but those are some of our attempts to try to to bring better shepherding care for the members. Right, good. Mark, you told me some years ago that when you came to Capitol Hill, it was primarily an elderly congregation. That during the first year, you performed an inordinate number of funerals. And you wondered if the Lord had not called you to that church at some point simply to close the doors yeah. because everybody had died off. Yeah. Some of the pastors who will be listening to this interview are men who are in discouraging situations, like the one that it must have been discouraging at times. And so I wonder how you found the grace of God to continue to persevere and then describe for pastors in such situations some of the things the Lord did to help you uh, grow the church numerically and to bring younger people and spiritual vitality to mm -hmm. the life of the church. Well, the, the growth of the church is, as Paul tells the Corinthians, God's business. You know, someone plants, someone waters, but it's God that gives the growth. So I think if there are... Folks listening to this who are in churches uh, that are elderly, and uh, particularly if you're in an area with uh, not much population and even that's declining population, uh, you obviously should not be discouraged that your numbers are not growing. Yes, you want to evangelize all the non-Christians in your community, but you know if you have a church of 40 people and you're in a farming community uh, and you're part of the county has 2,000 people in it and there are six other churches. Uh, Fred, it's not surprising that that not much more is going to happen, like the church growth books say. Your call is to be faithful. Uh, the Lord may have you there to shepherd those dear saints to the grave. He died for them. So it is an honorable ministry to not get glory to yourself. Nobody's going to praise you for what you're doing. Just to faithfully shepherd them. Now, if God wants to bring economic growth to the county next to you so that spillover bedroom communities start to pop up, you know, 15 minutes from your church, well, that's, that's the Lord's business, and, and people can write up books about how your church grew, and you, but you just need to remember the truth and not get prideful about it. And, you know. So in, in my own situation, uh, we were not in that kind of situation. We were an elderly congregation, 130 people when I first came there, average age of probably 75. Uh, they had had meetings about whether or not just to close down the church because they, they had been a prospering congregation of 1,000 people 50 years earlier. So they had just seen throughout the second half of the 20th century their size get smaller and smaller and smaller. And that was discouraging to them. But they had never been a liberal church. They had always believed the gospel, preached the Bible. And even through difficult times, they had persevered. So there was, a, there was in one sense, a lot to work with. And I just, when I went there, I mean, I remember talking to you about this. I didn't know what the Lord was going to do. I didn't know if we were just going to have uh, this thing that I've just mentioned of me just shepherding, shepherding these dear saints to the grave, you know, get them to the to the river, and then they cross over to the celestial city, and then Mr. Greatheart, the pastor, turns <laughs> yeah. around, and maybe I go to another church, because this one closes down. Yeah. Uh, but hey, we weren't the only evangelical church in Washington. D.C. will be fine. you know. Or maybe the Lord would, would do something else there. Well, the Lord did something else there. Uh, you know, We saw uh, younger people begin to come, uh, and in greater numbers. So when I went there, I was literally the age of the grandchildren of the people I was preaching to. Because they were in their 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. and we had several in their 90s and over 100. Uh, and, you know, I was 33 or 32 when I first preached there. 33, I guess. Well, now, uh, 14 years later, uh, I'm the age of the parents of most of the people <laughs> I'm preaching to. I mean, at, at 14 years, that's pretty, it's pretty fast to go over three generations. Mm -hmm. You know, but mm -hmm. that's what happens when the people born in 1910 and 1900 die. And all of a sudden, the, the majority of the people you're preaching to were born in 1980 or 1985. And, you know, I was born in 1960. So, wow, I, I, I cared for my grandparents' generation. My parents' generation was largely gone. They were in the suburbs or just, mm -hmm. as my generation, they were just not around. 
But then my kids' generation, you know, that's that's the ones who are there now. And yeah. uh, it's exciting. What we've done to draw them, I would just say, try to be clear on the gospel, take Christianity seriously, realize that we're in an age that's antagonistic to Christianity, and address that head on. Good, good. Um, you, Mark, believe that all pastors should be pastor theologians. Do you know what I... Yeah, yeah but yeah. you too, Steve, believe <laughs> no. all pastors should be pastor <laughs> theologians. I, just, would you make the case for that? Uh, it, it's, it's perhaps <clears throat> the sort of people who would be listening to this interview, it might be an obvious case, yeah. but I, th- I think the case needs to be made and perhaps... Some of us just need to be able to articulate it better. So right. perhaps that's the help I'm seeking from you here. Well, I, I don't think every pastor is uh, is going to be alike. And therefore, I'm a little reluctant to hold up. Uh, when we say theologian, people think of, or some people will think of Jerome or Augustine yeah. or Calvin in their studies and, you know, pouring over the original languages. And uh, certainly, I don't want pastors to be pragmatists. But the Lord gives different pastors different gifts. And Calvin, you know, talked about there being uh, basically doctors and pastors. And he understood a doctor to possibly, and maybe even probably be a pastor. He certainly did not understand all pastors to be doctors. He understood himself to be both. A pastor will be tending his flock. A doctor will be in a flock and part of tending that flock, but he will write and produce materials that are useful for many pastors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the Lord is always going to raise up folks to be um, shepherding their own flock, but also helping other shepherds. So I, I don't want to make a, an already busy pastor feel guilty for not doing that. I do, probably for most pastors, want to just help cast their eyes up a little bit. You know, look beyond your own congregation to the other churches out there in your area. You know, how are you being a blessing to them? How are you caring for your brother shepherds? Uh, part of that may be by you trying to find what your church is doing well and find ways you can share that with others. Certainly in your ministry to your own congregation, you want to be giving yourself to know God better, to know his word better. In that sense, you must be a theologian. And according to the gifts the Lord has given you, yeah, you want to pursue that with seriousness. So I think the responsibility for raising up future pastors falls not on seminaries like Trinity, but falls on pastors like Steve. You know, I think I think that that you and I are the ones who, under God, in in the in the sort of laboratory and family of the church, the local church, the local congregation, we're the ones who need to be having an eye out for those who uh, could be good shepherds, good under shepherds, and whom we could give ourselves to develop mm-hmm. and encourage. Mm-hmm. The sem- it is not the job of the seminary to sort that out. The poor seminary is an educational institution. It utterly relies on the churches for being churches. So we must be very careful with our recommendations. Yes. Those that we send to seminaries, that the seminaries should not have to sort that through. We should be very vigilant for the professors at seminaries who are members of our church, that they not be straying outside the doctrinal bounds of Christianity and of orthodoxy. Again, a seminary should not have to get into litigation with one of their professors for denying the bodily resurrection. We should be all over that as their pastor long mm-hmm. before it ever came mm-hmm. to their employer. Yes. So there are all kinds of ways in which we as pastors need to re-own responsibility for the health of the church, and for raising up the next generation of pastors. Good. What, Mark, are three books that you would recommend, and for the sake of modesty, will even exclude any of the ones you've authored? Although I would not hesitate to recommend any of them. I've read them, and they're immensely helpful. But excluding for the sake of modesty the books that you have authored or edited, what three books concerning pastoral ministry specifically would you recommend to the pastors who will listen to this interview? Can I not give you three? Can I just talk about a few different books? Sure, that's fine. Okay, Knowing God by Packer is just, what a great gift to the church. Uh, Of Piper's stuff, I would say if if you have to pick one, I'll take The Pleasures of God to get right to the heart of it all theologically. If you're going to have a fight over things Packer's saying, don't fight over the use of the word hedonism. Let's go right to understanding should God act for God's own pleasure. Yes. That's the key. Mm-hmm. Um, Lloyd-Jones' Preaching and Preachers is wonderful. I do not agree with all of it. But it is provocative in a godly fashion. 
And uh, he, he certainly didn't care even what people thought at the time. So there's all the more uh, out of step he could feel with what people are thinking today. And there's a, a refreshingness to that. Spurgeon's lectures to my students is not as useful. It's good. There's a lot that's good in it, but it's very long. Yes. And a lot of it's fairly situationally specific. Stott's Between Two Worlds is excellent on preaching. Um, on the ministry as a whole, Charles Bridges' book, The Christian mm -hmm. Ministry, that mm -hmm. Banner Truth publishes, mm -hmm. yeah. is the kind of core book in our internship. It's not without its problems. It's written by an Anglican minister in the 1840s, and there's all, there are all kinds of social status things that he addresses in that book that really aren't the case with evangelical ministers today. But it's a very useful book. Reformed Pastor by Baxter. Mm, I'd say if you have a sensitive conscience, don't read it. If you have more one of those cast iron consciences that you can make it through anything, you need it. The first chapter to examine yourself to see if you are, in fact, wow. converted. That's right. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, biographies that would be helpful. Uh, I think Spurgeon's autobiography is one of my favorite books. Give you a great idea of what the Lord can do. And if you pick up a good biography of John Wesley, it'll give you a good idea of what you can do. Uh, Wesley is one of the most amazing figures in Christian history. He, uh, I've often told C.J. Mahaney that C.J. reminds me of Wesley in some ways. Uh, the, the amount of self-discipline, self-examination, willingness to squeeze out the last drop for the Lord. Uh, I find Wesley's biography very moving to read. Very good. Are we done? Okay. Mark, thank you very much. Steve, it's great to have the time with you. Thank you, brother. God bless you. And you. Thanks. <laughs>